Steve Tomac, Senior Legislative Representative at Basin Electric Power Cooperative, has a wealth of experience in agriculture and cooperatives. Prior to joining Basin in 2008, Tomac was the Executive Director of the North Dakota Farm Credit Council and worked for Farm Credit Services of Mandan for six years. During that time, he also served on the board for Moore Grand Sioux Electric Cooperative and the Southwest Water Authority. Tomac served 16 years in the North Dakota legislature. Maybe that's his door-to-door -door part, okay. He was first elected to the North Dakota House of Representatives in 1986, where he served two years, and then he moved to the North Dakota Senate, where he served from 1990 to 2002. Tomac was raised on a ranch in southwestern North Dakota and is the second oldest of 18 children. I bet they used a bike. Um, he's a graduate of North Dakota State University with a degree in Ag Economics and Communication. In 2008, he was inducted into the North Dakota Cowboy Hall of Fame for his 35 years of travel across the United States and Canada as a professional rodeo clown. Now that's diverse. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce you to Steve. Welcome. Eric, thank you. Eric, uh, thank you. Um, I'm not sure how close I need to be to this mic, so if you can't hear me, just wave. But uh, appreciate that generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Actually, just one story about growing up in a family of 18, if I can, if you'll bear with me. My oldest brother uh, retired uh, two years ago as a, uh, a professional firefighter in Rapid City, South Dakota. But I remember when Jack got married. You know, we grew up in a three-bedroom house. There was one bedroom for the boys, there was one bedroom for the girls, and there was one bedroom for mom and dad. And obviously there was twin double beds there, so it was two or three to a bed. And after my older brother got married a long time ago, we were sitting down having a cup of coffee, and he looked at me with just the straightest face, and he says, you know what, Steve? I grew up the oldest of 18 kids. I never knew what it was like to sleep alone until after I got married. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and I uh, appreciate the invite. What we're going to try to do this morning is just give you a, a brief introduction into the world of electricity, and, and actually one of North Dakota's own Basin Electric, and our uh, interest and efforts into green energy as, as it was. And I think to uh, start this off, if I can figure it out, figure out the technology here. I want to start it out. We recorded Art Link uh, a couple years uh, prior to his passing. And Art was really a leader and he really sets the stage for this discussion. And so I'm going to kick it over to Art here. I can figure out how to do this. And when we are through with that and the landscape is quiet again, when the drag lines the blasting rigs, the power shovels, and the huge gondolas cease to rip and roar. And when the last bulldozer has pushed, has pushed the last spoil pile into place, and the last patch of barren earth has been seeded to grass or grain, let those who follow and repopulate the land be able to say, our grandparents did their job well. This land is as good, and in some cases, better than before. Only if they can say this, will we be worthy of the rich heritage of our land and its resources. Let me figure out how... Uh... So that was, that was actually art, uh, a speech that Art Link had given to the North Dakota Association of Rural Electric Co-ops in 1973. And it's important as we start that this, this discussion uh, because at that point in time, there was a huge debate on land reclamation and what coal mining would do to that particular area. 
And Art Link was not met with a, um, a totally receptive crowd at the Rural Electric Association. Uh, this is actually a picture of, uh, of, of, of that at that particular event. And, you know, we've gone through some, some pretty contentious times as we've moved forward on this. And so, but I thought it was, it really set the stage because it really shows you how this thing kind of ebbs and flows as we've moved along. The concern from the rural electric co-ops at that point in time was, what will the economies look like? Will we, will we be able to generate electricity? Will we be able to afford electricity? Will we be able to move this forward? And so we worked through that. I remember this very well. I was a sophomore at North Dakota State University. Uh, and frankly, that is one of the reasons I became a Democrat, is because Art Link was championed the cause at that point in time on some environmental fronts. And that was really uh, inspired me as a young person who wanted to be involved in politics. But to put, let me put back up one step here and talk a little bit about Basin Electric. Basin Electric was formed in 1961. And it was actually, at that point in time, was formed because the rural electrics needed a supplemental power supplier. Up to that point, rural electrics got all their uh, electricity from the dams, from the hydroelectric system. But they recognized that they were going to exceed what the hydroelectric system, the dams, could produce. And so they formed this co-op. There were uh, co-ops similar to Moore Grand Sioux and Capital Electric, which served Bismarck, Mandan area, and a number of other co-ops that got together and says, we need to do something in addition to this. We need to supplement this in some form. So in 1961, Basin Electric was formed. Uh, by 1966, we had the first uh, coal plant, uh, Mine Mouth facility, which would be the Lee Ole Station, just southeast of Stanton was built. And by 60, uh, the late 60, early 70s, I guess it was, we had Lee Ole's uh, substation, or Lee Ole Station 2 was, was also built. And so that was, that was part of what really created Basin Electric and how we were formed. They were mine mouth facilities right in the area that Art Link was talking about. Um, you know, one of the interesting things that he said, one of my favorite parts of that whole speech, though, was where Governor Link says, our grandparents did their job well. Because I think, as we look back, I really believe that Basin Electric has really did their job well, too. And I've been a proud employee of Basin now for eight years. So let's jump ahead a little bit now to the... Energy Policy Act of 2005. So we're going to go from 1961-65. Let me, let me just back up a step there, too, and talk about what happened in the interim there. So by 75, Basin Electric had built uh, an additional, the second unit to Leol's one. And, by, and then comes a natural gas shortage. Who in the room remembers the energy shortage of the late 70s, mid, early 70s, and what that, what that all brought about? I mean, we all bring that. In sometime in the mid 70s, there was actually a prediction that said there will be no natural gas left by 1990. And that was in the mid 70s. And so Congress, in a reaction to this, passed a Fuel Use Act of 1978 that basically prohibited anyone from building electrical generation with natural gas, of fueling the electrical generation of natural gas. And so as the rural electrics saw their need for power to increase, the only option they had was to do coal. And so between 75 and uh, the, the mid 80s, which was uh, 85, 86, the co-ops also, the rural electric co-ops under the umbrella of Basin Electric also built two additional coal plants, one in uh, Wheatland, Wyoming, called the Laramie River Station, and one that was co-located adjacent to the Dakota Gasification Plant north of Beulah called the Antelope Valley Station. 
And so that's how we built the, uh, the basic framework. We've added one to that since then, the Dry Fork Station, which is located north of Gillette, and that was just commissioned in 20, uh, 2011, I think it was, something in that time frame. It was just a couple of years ago. It's our newest coal generation. All except one mine mouth facilities. Most of them built because of the Fuel Use Act prohibited us from even considering other fuels. So now we jump ahead from that era of time, and at that, by the mid 1980s, once the construction of those power plants uh, were completed, the um, we had overbuilt, and so there was a surplus of electricity from let's say 85 to 2000. We had overbuilt by that much, and our members actually paid a pretty high price for that cost during that point in time. And then things began to catch up and the economy began to take uh, steam again. You also keep in mind too that what was going on in rural America at that point in time. I mean, we all lived through the, the tough years in the 80s. <laughs> I was talking to my favorite bankers over here and I mean, when we look back what happened to uh, the rural areas uh, in the 1980s, uh, the late 80s, uh, I mean, there was huge inflation in the early 80s, and Reagan said, we're going to cure inflation, and we did, and it was at the expense of most rural communities. So uh, enormous out-migration, uh, rural communities just devastated, uh, went through, I was a member of Governor Sinner's uh, um, uh, task force on, on actually helping debt, uh, re reduce the debt and the anxiety around the farm debt of individual farmers. And so it was was a tough time and we really did that. I Just a sidebar here too, if I could, uh, I used to think that my dad, who's still living, he's 90 years old, saw a lot of changes during agriculture, in agriculture in his lifetime. But I have to say, I've seen more I think in the last 10 years than my dad saw in his lifetime. When you see what we've seen essentially starting in the 70s when we had a, a huge market develop for our wheat with the Russians and then the Russian grain embargo and then we go through this high period of, excuse me, high interest rates and then that crashed the economy and then this thing starts to rebuild sometime in the late 1990s, 2000s. And now I look, you know, in Morton County, we used to have, uh, you know, these Flasher, Carson, Elgin, New Leipzig, Heil. There used to be a little elevator there every 20, 10 or 15, five miles sometimes, and they had uh, a capacity of 100 to 150,000 bushels of capacity. But today, those communities are almost non existent, but there are farms every five to 10 miles that have on-farm storage capacity of 100 to 300,000 bushels. And so, and we've got the technology in agriculture that allows them to triple or quadruple the, the production. But that little bit of a sidebar there, I just find it totally fascinating what we've really experienced. Back to Basin Electric. One of the things that I think Basin Electric is most proud of as we made, as we did gone forward here was going back to Art Link's speech and land reclamation is what we're really talking about. And when you drive through the energy corridor, the energy valley from Washburn over to Beulah, and you look on both the north side, uh, primarily on the south side of the road, right near the uh, Leland Old Station and then Stanton Station, and as you make your way uh, across there, most of that land was actually mined. And this is a snapshot of what that actually looks like from that highway. You cannot tell uh, that it has been mined. Uh, and it actually comes back in, in probably better shape than it was in many cases. Leap forward now to 2005. So we went through this Fuel Use Act of 78, uh, had to build coal. And then in 2005, there was a Energy Policy Act passed, signed by President Bush, uh, George W. And uh, what that did is it really provided some incentives for wind energy. 
Now, Basin Electric really wasn't new to, really didn't have a lot of experience, but it wasn't totally new to Basin Electric in 2005 when the, when the Energy Supply Act was, uh, Policy Act was passed. We had began uh, already experimenting with, uh, um, with a couple different, uh, a, a couple different uh, wind towers. There were two um, that you may be aware of, just south of Minot, that have been there for a long time. They're on the east side of the highway. They're shorter, and they've been. We we had so few at that time. We actually nicknamed them. One was Willie, and one was Wally. And uh, there was uh, actually Wally was the was Wally Byer, who many of you are very familiar with. But and then there were also two that we had experimented with that we'd put up on an experimental basis near Chamberlain, South Dakota, which you can see from I-90. And so that was in the early 2000s as we tried to test this out to see what was possible, what wasn't possible. In 2005, uh, a number of things happened besides the Energy Policy Act. One is this committee met, and as it happens, I just happen to be a member of that committee. This was the Resolutions Committee of Basin Electric in 2005. It's a representation of all the districts of Basin Electric. They meet one, The Resolutions Committee meets once a year, like most cooperatives, to consider what direction, what policies, what resolution do we want to resolve ourselves for as we move forward. This particular committee took a bold step. They uh, challenged the Basin membership, and it was passed at the full membership meeting, with a 10 by 10 resolution. 10% renewable by 2010, in 2005. And so that is only a decade ago. But it was a pretty bold step, because at that point in time, Basin Electric had about 2,300 megawatts of power. And that would have meant that meant that by 2010, Basin was going to commit itself to finding 230 of those megawatts coming from green energy or from renewable sources. A huge step as we start to look at how things change and, and, and where they go. And so uh, this is on the, on the uh, right, and on the, I think on the right-hand side, that's Willie and Wally, uh, my right, yeah, you're right. And on the left, I think that's the... Uh, was uh, the wind turbines in Chamberlain, South Dakota. And so as we move forward, I, a couple things come to mind. This is a, uh, our CEO, Ron Harper, at that time in 2005. And it's an interesting story because as we began to challenge ourselves with how we're going to find this 230 megawatts of uh, renewable development, renewable wind, uh, we co-ops don't have a tax appetite. Co-ops can't use the tax attributes that the Energy Policy Act offered as an incentive to build wind. So we needed to engage a third party that would have that tax appetite. Uh, and one of those was uh, Florida Power and Light, now called Next Era. And in the early in the early meetings with Next Era, Ron Harper had this meeting and uh, they they did it on a handshake, really. It was on a handshake to start with in 2005, 2006, that Florida Power and Light was going to develop the wind. And they were careful about, we were pretty careful about who we were doing business with. But the story goes that, that the executive director of Florida Power and Light invited him to breakfast to talk through the finer points of the deal and of the relationship. And when they were through uh, talking about that, they got up to lead and Ron said to him, that to which you commit, you must perform. And they shook hands. And Ron liked that. He wanted to commit to that. So he went back to his office because the executive was going to come to the basin headquarters to meet with the board later on. And he sat down at his computer and just typed a simple contract that said, that to which you commit, you must perform. They both signed it that day. And that's how our strong relationship with Florida Power and Light uh, developed and evolved. And it's, uh, it's a strong foundation that's lasted uh, for many years. Since that time, Basin Electric has, we have did, uh, you know, I really have to add this up as to how many contracts we've completed with Florida Power and Light or now Next Era. 
probably the most recent were in South Dakota. But subsequent to that, in 2008 or 2009, the Congress, for a very short period of time, actually offered a grant for wind development in lieu of the PTC, the Production Tax Credit. And that grant gave the opportunity to co-ops like Basin Electric the uh, opportunity to actually build their own wind farms. And largely in, to, because of that grant program, uh, Basin Electric built two wind farms, and we were at, at that point in time, in 2010 and 2012, owned, and I think maybe still do, the largest cooperatively owned wind farm in the United States. Those One of those is located south of Minot, Prairie Winds, North Dakota. Uh, so that one was built largely because of the grant program that allowed us to own that and use that tax attribute or actually is a direct grant in lieu of the tax attribute. We also built one in, in uh, South Dakota, in central South Dakota, southeast of Pier, approximately 80 miles. So Prairie Winds, North Dakota, the one you see south of Minot as you travel up there has 82 turbines. It's about 12,000 acres and it involved about 60 landowners. Um, the one in South Dakota is, um, is uh, slightly larger than that. And as we started down the road of, of trying to understand and, and build wind and renewable energy, we have run across a few things. And I wanted to include just this one slide that gives you a one little short video, gives you an idea of some of the things that we that no one even thought about as, as, we, as we started down this road of wind development. Um, I can find my clicker here. Back up here. Th there's no sound on this, but one of the things that we did see uh, and learned very quickly uh, Actually, this was actually taken in Wisconsin, and so we didn't have to repeat this here, but it's called flicker. So if you locate turbines too close to residences, this is what you get. It's a flicker that can be very, very annoying. Uh, and especially if you're the unfortunate homeowner that lived right in this area. So this is a, a, a short video clip of... of what that would feel like and if you can imagine on an infrequent basis this thing going around and around that is next to that. Fortunately we have siting laws and we've worked through all of those. I think the PSC in North Dakota has adopted a siting law that I, for some reason I want to say 1400 feet from a residence or a thousand to 1400 feet from a residence and it's the same for a road. So we do have siting requirements to try and avoid some of the challenges like flicker that that we've uh, that we've encountered. Um, Prairie Winds, North Dakota, it gives you a rough idea, kind of central North Dakota, and in South Dakota, it's located near White, South Dakota, uh, and uh, it's slightly larger. A couple unique things about the project in South Dakota is that we were able to partner with MTI, the Mitchell Technical Institute, which actually has a program for wind techs. And so Mitchell Technical Institute wanted in the worst way to own a wind turbine. And this is within, I think, 60 miles of Mitchell. And so we were able to work out a deal where Mitchell Technical Institute actually owns this turbine. We buy the output from them. They use it as a training for their wind techs and also for their power technology course. Fantastic deal. The other thing we did in South Dakota was with the South Dakota Wind Partners. That was a group of farmers in that area that also wanted to make an investment in a wind farm. And so we uh, did a separate side agreement. I believe they own eight turbines, eight or 10 turbines that they bought, were able to capture the, the uh, PTC and utilize that. We buy the power output, output from them. And that allowed us to actually expand that particular wind farm uh, just a little bit. So very proud of those uh, innovative efforts. I'm not sure how many of you have ever really thought about this when you've driven by a wind farm, but the, Claudia, do you remember how 
tall the state capitol building is. I think it's pretty close to 260 feet. I, all right. <laughs> so wind turbine, thank you very much. <laughs> So the state capital is roughly 240 feet. The wind turbines are roughly 260 feet, just a tish taller, maybe one story or two stories taller than the state capital. So when you drive by these from the highway, they look back, they, they don't appear to be that tall, but that's how tall they are. 138 tons, each blade weighs seven tons. Uh, and when you think about that, uh, the, the enormity of all that, the other thing that's really interesting to me is that those blades turn at, a, the tips of those blades are traveling 160 miles per hour. Um, you know, actually they have governors on them, and so at, at most of the time, that's, that's the usual maximum productive speed, if I understand it right, but that, that's a good question. And one of the other things that we're really uh, proud of that helps our efficiency or capacity on those is our wind techs. Um, can you imagine, to start with, we didn't have man lifts or elevators in these. Can you imagine throwing on a case of oil on the back to go up to change oil in the Naxel into the turbine and walking up the height of the state capital with that on your backpack and up and down anything you needed. That didn't take us too long to figure out that we needed some lifts in there. And so those are now equipped with, with lifts where we can actually raise and lower the, uh, the equipment that's needed to service that. But we give a lot of credit to our capacity. Most of these wind farms were actually developed with a capacity factor of the somewhere between 30 and 40%. We thought if we could get power out of them somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the time where the wind was blowing hard enough to generate that, that would be good. I can tell you that this last year our average capacity in South Dakota was just a shade under 50 percent. A large amount of that credit actually goes to our wind decks and our service program. Another part of that, though, is just where you locate these. It makes a huge difference as to whether you locate them here or 30 feet over here or here. It, it, there's, there's a huge science all the way around that as you do that. Um, another issue uh, as we develop that that we really hadn't thought about until you sit back and think about it is the whooping crane. Now, whooping cranes are pretty smart animals. They're pretty smart birds. They have for centuries, as far as I know, used the flyways because of the great wind that's in the flyways to make their migration north to south and south to north. So I guess it would stand to reason if we had sat back and thought, think about it, that if we put wind towers in there, it may or may not impact the migration patterns of birds that actually use the same wind. And so, but one of the things we did work out early on with the Fish and Wildlife Service was the uh, agreement that these turbines will not operate once there's a sighting of a whooping crane. It's an endangered bird. And so I can tell you that we have biologists on staff um, and they're staffed largely in the spring and, and in the fall during the fly times. And our staffs, our techs uh, that run these, are trained to uh, recognize these birds. And if there's a sighting within any distance of a wind turbine, those turbines are shut down until we determine where and when. And they, if the bird is within uh, one mile of those turbines, they remain shut down until the bird decides it wants to leave. And so that's part of the agreement, the permit that we went through with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so, come 2010, we not only met the goal that the Resolutions Committee passed in 2005, we exceeded it. We, in 2010, we were at 12.5% uh, of our capacity was renewable energy. Um, I, I, there's a slide in here that I wanted to get to, um, actually, let me back up a step here, too, because it wasn't just renewable energy that we were able to meet it with. 
I'm particularly proud of something we have. I have a small ranch by St. Anthony, but we have a, a renewable resource called heat recovery units. So the northern border pipeline kind of transects North Dakota from northwest to southeast. And every 40 miles, this is a natural gas pipeline, every 40 miles there's roughly there's a pump station. And those pump stations use natural gas as a fuel to push the natural gas on down the pipeline to the next stop. And they basically vent the heat that they that's used as a to fuel the pump stations. Um, sometime in the mid 2000s, 2006, 7, maybe a little bit before that, ORMAT developed a technology that was able to capture that waste heat and convert it into electricity. So we have equipped eight of those. We have a contract with uh, for eight of those pump stations to pick up. Uh, it's five and a half megawatts for each station, and it just takes that waste heat, it runs it through a condenser and a process before it's vented and we're able to capture five and a half megawatts almost continuously. It's almost base load as we do that. And I, I think that's such a remarkable uh, remarkable technology. There's one located near Saint, southeast of St. Anthony, not too far from my ranch, and it just runs all the time. It gives more Grand Sioux uh, uh, more voltage support for the system there. And it makes so much sense. We buy the uh, electricity off of eight of those uh, 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 heat recovery stations. And I think some of the other utilities along the line do the same. But it isn't just wind that we're talking about. We're also dipping our toe in the water in solar. However, I can tell you that solar on the northern climates doesn't have as much of appeal. It's a little bit harder. Even though our sunlight is, is more direct, uh, there's, it's got a lot of limitations in the northern tier climates. Then comes the challenge of the Bakken. And I can tell you that starting in 2008, our load forecast curve starts to go like this because we don't know what to prepare for. We had overbuilt in the 80s, we're a little bit gun shy, uh, what to prepare for. We had been through these uh, boom and bust cycles twice now as the communities out there had. And so as we approach this, we did finally uh, join up with the state and in uh, 2009 or 10 uh, uh, hire KLJ to do a study as to what the load forecast. And around 2012 or 13, we started to get comfortable with, you know, an estimation of where we think we need to be by 2025 or 2030. And that, inclu that increases our current capacity by somewhere between 15 and 1800 megawatts. Now, to put that into perspective, 1,500, 1,800 megawatts, what does that really mean? What that means is this, is that Antelope Valley Station, north of Beulah, has two 450 megawatt units. That's 900 megawatts that we generate out of Antelope Valley Station. What that means is we need two more of them. We need two Antelope Valley Stations really to meet our need by our best projections by 2025 or 2030. Huge undertaking except for this. We were able, we have been able up to this point to find some excess power from other utilities in the region and as we've done that and so we've got some PPA, some purchase power agreements and the other challenge we have is to build some transmission into that area so that we're able to feed it uh, into that area too. So we've got some Huge roads to go yet. Uh, we've built some interim generation, if you will, some uh, natural gas where we can uh, use some natural gas and there are more ref natural gas refineries going up in the area. And so we're getting there, but it's, it's still a huge lift as we look forward. One of the biggest challenges we've got as we move forward here is something that was released on August 3rd, and that's the Clean Power Plan. And if you haven't heard about this yet, you will be hearing a lot about it in the near future. And that is a huge, uh, huge challenge to us uh, in the utility world. EPA has essentially uh, issued a final rule. It hasn't been published yet. But what the rule does is actually lowers the emissions of CO2. Up to this point, our 
emissions or our environmental controls have been largely for sulfur and for NOx and for mercury. And now that the Supreme Court has said that CO2 falls underneath that, EPA has felt compelled to issue a rule that reduced carbon uh, dioxide emissions. And the final rule actually says North Dakota needs to reduce its carbon dioxide emission, emissions by 45 from coal generation. This is not from vehicles or anything else. This is just coal generation. By 45% by 2030. And in South Dakota, it's 48. And so this essentially hits the upper Midwest. The reason this is a bit more of a challenge than it is in some of the other parts of the United States is our coal fleet is younger. Remember the Fuel Use Act of 78? We've had to actually, we were more impacted by that because we were just developing our resources at that point in time. A lot of the coal developed in Ohio and Pennsylvania, a lot of that is close to the end of its useful life. And so you don't have a lot of stranded costs. But And so they've make, been making the conversion to natural gas and to other lower emitting uh, CO2. One of the challenges, just from perspective, you may want to keep this figure in mind, a coal unit emits about somewhere between 21 and 2300 pounds of CO2 per ton, a per megawatt hour. A natural gas unit is about half that, about 1100. And so they've been converting these in anticipation of this and partly because their useful life has, has, uh, is, is closer to its end than, than what. So we've got some, some huge challenges as we move forward with the clean power plan. So the challenge we have too here is that the clean power plan as proposed doesn't recognize what we've already done. It doesn't recognize the excess. We we're at over 15% renewable in our portfolio, and we've done that based on what our membership wanted, not what a government regulation wanted. And so as we move forward, it doesn't recognize this. It takes a base year of 2012 to say, from this point forward, you need to do this. And so that becomes a huge challenge. And so the, the 800, 700, 800 megawatts of wind we already developed really don't count to helping satisfy the new emission controls that we have. The goal that we had set for our membership is not met according to EPA. To put this into perspective, and these are not my figures, it's the North Dakota Public Service Commission figures, and I think just from generalities, what the PSC says, and we're doing our own internal review about what we need to do, is to meet the clean power plan and to North Dakota statewide would have to build 5,000 turbines. That in itself is, is going to be a challenge because as we move forward, we not only have the NIMBYs, we all know what NIMBYs are, not in my backyard. So you've got those people that are concerned. And actually, you know, I agree with some of the NIMBY concerns and I appreciate a process that says, you know, we should have individual landowners be able to go somewhere and say, this is not right. You can't do this because of this, this, and this. But the NIMBYs don't concern me as much as the NOPES do, not on planet Earth. Uh, and, and that really tends to really complicate things because we've got more and more folks in the NOPE category rather than the NIMBY category. And so how will we develop, first of all, 5,000 turbines? at a spacing requirement that we're currently required to do. And what is that going to cost? Well, just to put that into perspective, uh, we did some rough math on this. 5,000 turbines would take pretty close to a million acres. And a million acres, what's that? A million acres would be if you took from here to Jamestown a swath 15 miles wide, that would be a million acres. Burley County is real close to a million acres. And so that puts that into perspective. But again, you need to site these less than or more than a thousand foot from a residence, more than a thousand foot from existing roads. And so to think you're going to be actually able to do this in a million acres is, is probably not, not feasible, not realistic. How much is it going to cost? 
Somewhere, I can tell you this, uh, at today's market, those 5,000 turbines would be somewhere near 10 billion with a B dollars, is what that would cost. And that's just North Dakota's approach to the clean power plan. That doesn't include the South Dakota, the Wyoming. Basin Electric operates in nine states. That doesn't include any of the other states. And so, as you can probably recognize, we are really really concerned about this. I did want to comment just on a few of the other things that were, uh, I've already did part of this, but just recently within the last two weeks, the, uh, the gentleman in the lower left-hand corner there, the guy in the middle with the red tie is Paul Sukut, our CEO, the guy on to his, to the left of the picture is Governor Mead in Wyoming, just signed an agreement at our Dry Fork station north of Gillette to do uh, ITC, the uh, program which will actually explore opportunities to capture the CO2 off of the dry fork station and utilize that. Uh, and so that's something uh, really uh, new technology that we're uh, looking at in, in, uh, in Wyoming uh, that will benefit our system wide. I already talked about the heat recovery station, but I did also want to mention that at our Dakota gas plant uh, near Beulah, which is co-located by the Antelope Valley Station, we have already captured 30 million metric tons of CO2 as part of the, I'm not a, not a very good chemist, I can tell you that, but as part of the process to create natural gas out of coal, we are able to peel off the CO2 relatively easy as part of the, I think it's in the rectosol process, peel that off. We currently put that in a pipeline and that goes to uh, southern Saskatchewan where the CO2 is used in a carbon capture or a EOR, enhanced oil recovery project, uh, to, uh, at an aging oil field. And so we are doing and have been doing an, of some very innovative things as we go forward. But again, EPA has not given us any credit for this and as we move forward, all this is for not when it comes to compliance with EPA. Just an interesting thing that you may be interested in too, I threw this slide in because it gives you an idea of where we're at today. Just look at the right hand uh, pie chart and that red is 7.9, that is the environmental cost of your power bill if you get your power from a rural electric co-op. Roughly 8% of your power bill goes to environmental costs that we currently do. So that's without CO2 or in anticipation of that. Um, so that's to capture the sulfur, the mercury, the NOx, and, and the rest of those uh, bad boys. Um, that actually is a result of about a $1.5 billion investment by, at all our power plants by Basin at an annual operating cost of $155 million. It costs us roughly $155 million just to operate those technologies to to, uh, for environmental costs. If you are interested, I would offer this invitation, interested in the clean power plan and how it may or may impact you. Our annual meeting is coming up on November 3rd and we will have a town hall meeting at the Civic Center, Bismarck Civic Center, the morning of November 3rd. And you are more than welcome to attend if you're interested in learning more about the clean power plan and how it's going to impact the region. I wanted to close with, uh, again, with uh, something that Art Link said. Uh, again, this was recorded. This is part of his original speech in 73, but was recorded a couple of years ago. Um, we do not want to halt progress. See, I was answering those who said, I was being charged with, uh, with putting the brakes on the economic development. We do not plan to be selfish and say, North Dakota will not share its energy resources. No. We simply want to ensure the most efficient and environmentally sound method of utilizing our precious soil and water resources for the benefit of the broadest number of people possible. I think Governor Link, had, I think the world of Governor Link, I really do. He was one of my mentors, I'm proud to say that. I think Governor Link's North Dakota wasn't yet home to large-scale wind projects when he delivered that in 1973. Um, I think we're able to generate electricity in more ways than coal and water now, but his common sense approach still fits. Um, 
we want to ensure the most reliable and cost-effective means of keeping the lights on. And in the end, we really do want to make sure that our grandchildren are able to say our grandparents did their job well. Uh, thank you, and I'd be more than happy if we have time, uh, Eric, to respond to any questions.